Welcome to The Spotlight, the podcast where veterans and military spouses connect and share how their military experience has transformed their lives and their businesses. Here's your host, Bob Lalvin. Hey, this is your host, Bob Lalvin, founder of the Veteran Crowd Network, the network that brings veterans and veteran-led businesses together with each other and the resources they need to prosper. And you are tuning into The Spotlight. Hey, welcome everybody. Welcome to the program. I have a return guest today, Bobby Garland, a former police detective in New York City and now the CEO of Fund the First. When last we spoke, we were getting this thing off the ground and a lot has happened since December of 2020. Bobby, welcome to the program. I can't believe it's been that long since we since we last talked about this thing. So, uh, boy, you know, what's going on? How are you first? How are things going? Things are going great, Bob. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me back on the show. And how are you? I'm, you know, I'm doing, I'm doing good. You know, life is, life is good. We're coming out of this COVID thing. I don't have to wear a mask anymore. So, you know, it's great to be back. Hey, you know, let's, let's talk a little bit. Hey, tell everybody about what Fun the First is. How did it come about? And then we're going to dig into kind of the update and the progress because I know there's a lot to share there. Sure. So I'm sure everyone's familiar with the crowdfunding space. Everyone wants to raise funds for different causes, you know, whether it be an illness, a surgery, a death, a toy drive, whatever it is. Um, but everyone normally goes to those go-to names. They go to GoFundMe, they go to Kickstarter, they go to Indiegogo, Fundly. There's actually 191 platforms out there. You know, the crowdfunding space is so large and people, sometimes they don't know where to go. And they're always researching, they say, which one do I trust? And then you always hear these horror stories. You hear, um, you know, someone got scammed, there was fraud, there was this, there was that, there's too many fees. So we created Fund the First to eliminate all of that. And we went live in July 4th of 2020, and we're coming up on our two year mark that we've been live. And it's been so incredible. We've been able to give back the country a trusted service that they can rely on to raise funds. We're partnered with ID.me. And with ID.me, we're able to verify everything. We verify group status, whether you be a first responder, military, medical provider, teacher, nurse, and then we verify identity as well. So what that allows, when someone starts a fundraiser on our platform, it allows the donors to understand that their money is going to a true and honest and verified source, and that's it. So normally what you see on these fundraising platforms, you'll see an organizer raise the funds, and then the organizer receives those funds. And then you're relying on that organizer to give it to the beneficiary. But what happens? They pocket it. They pocket it. They run away with it. They do X, Y, Z. There's duplicate campaigns. There's other people doing competitions to see who can raise more money for someone else that passed away. It's really horrible what goes on. On our platform, Bob, you come to our platform, you organize a campaign for, let's say, me, and I'm available. I'm, I'm not you know, incapacitated. I'm the one that receives those funds. You'll never touch that money. So it's really unique the way our process works with that. So since our launch, since since July of uh, 2020, we've had now, we're approaching 350 fundraisers on our platform that have surpassed almost $4 million raised. It's incredible. Mm-hmm. You know, the average campaign on our platform raises about $10,000, but there are campaigns that raise zero. And there's campaigns, we actually had one that raised $550,000. Wow. So it all, it fluctuates, but it's all dependent upon how you share. Sharing is everything. You know, sometimes people come to our platform and they say, oh, I started a fundraiser. Why am I not raising any funds? We give you all the tools on what to do. And sometimes people don't realize that they need to ask their network. They need to say, hey, please donate a dollar. It goes a long way. Please help me. Please help this cause, you know, to get to our goal or just raise any amount of funds that we're looking to raise. So we're here. We care. And we're really doing something special for the whole country. This this started out, I think, with veterans first responders, but you mentioned teachers and some mm-hmm. others. Run, run down the list again for me. Yeah, so originally when we started, we started with just first responders in the military, right? And then we noticed we could broaden the, broaden because we could verify all these different groups thank, thanks to our partnership with IVM. So we could also verify teachers. We could verify nurses. We could de- verify medical providers. Now, sometimes when people come to our platform, they'll see fundraising for those who serve. And they'll say, well, a teacher doesn't necessarily fit that criteria, right? And if you think about it, we see school shootings, unfortunately, right? Mm -hmm. We see school shootings. You see your child. I have kids, you know, 
someone gets hurt in school, who's the first responder in that situation? The teacher's there for your kid. So we're providing teachers with a way to fundraise in a trusted means as well. Bobby, was there an aha moment that you had at the beginning of this thing when you said, you know, we just need to do this? Was there something that triggered this thing? Yeah, so unfortunately, sometimes hardships trigger a good idea, right? And this came from one of my immediate supervisors, one of my closest friends, Jason Stocker. His daughter was diagnosed with a rare illness, and they wanted to start a GoFundMe. And when we were discussing GoFundMe, he was very reluctant to do it because he was afraid that someone, let's say in California, Florida, Texas, Alaska, was going to use his daughter's picture and do a fundraiser for the same cause, and then people get confused. The cause is going that, that kind of assholes out there that do that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. On it GoFundMe, on. is GoFundMe getting scammed a lot? I mean, Bob, let me tell you something. When a line of duty death occurs, and unfortunately we see it all too often nowadays, right? We're seeing, we're hearing about a cop killed once a week, twice a week, three times a week. When that happens, for some reason, people get in their head, I need to create a fundraiser for this person. Not the, not the, the immediate family, not the department, not their network, but some random person states away will come in and say, I'm going to create a fundraiser. And then they start collecting funds. But then the question comes in, how are those funds actually going to that family? How are they doing that? They have no connection, nothing. So that's the issue. And it happens within the first six to 24 hours of that death happening. You'll see not one, not two. You'll see about six fundraisers go up for that same line of duty death. Why don't, why don't people, I mean, do people not understand uh, uh, crowdfunding in general? I mean, uh, is there still, is still a lot of education that needs to go on out there? Uh, both there both to the people that are raising funds as well as the people that are donating the funds. There is a lot of education, and we do our best to educate people. We do, we have a large newsletter, and each week we're sending out stuff on our newsletter to educate how our platform works. But crowdfunding as a whole, People, they're so fast to just jump the gun. And then donors also, donors don't do their research. What they'll see is, oh, this campaign raised X amount of dollars and it's being viral right now. That's the one I'm going to donate to. But then what happens a week later, the department steps in and says, all donations on that fundraiser have now been returned because this was a false fundraiser. It was fake, it was fraud, it was a scam. So there's a lot of education that needs to be in the space for, like you said, for both the organizers the beneficiaries of campaigns and donors. You know, donors need to do a little extra research and that's why our platform is so trusted. The ID me aspect of it is so huge. It allows donors to know that that money is only going to a true and honest source. All right, so walk, walk me through that because mm -hmm. um, let's say, I don't know, I, I had a friend of mine that passed away, uh, was killed in the military, whatever, uh, you know, something of that nature. I wanted to do something for his family. Um, uh, walk me through the verification process. How are you checking out Bob, right, mm -hmm. who's raising money for Joe who, you know, uh, suffered some kind of a tragic loss and money's going to his family. How do, how do you make sure that I actually spend the money the way that, that it's, in, it's described to be done? Well, Bob, like what I mentioned earlier, you'll never touch those spots. So what's unique about this is you would come to our platform and – you go to fundthefirst.com, you'll click start a fundraiser. Now, in this scenario that you're bringing up, it's someone that passed away. So there's a there's an option to click someone else unavailable, which means that person is incapacitated, they passed away, whatever. Now, it will show you as the organizer, and then you would be able to manually input who that beneficiary will be, whether it be the next of kin, the family of, whatever it is. You go through your setup process of your fundraiser, typing out the campaign, including pictures, and then at the end of it, it's going to prompt you to verify. Since the beneficiary is unavailable, we're asking that the organizer verify. So it would verify your military status, and then this fundraiser can go live. Now that gives the donors a sense of trust to know that someone's verified on this campaign, right? But now the question comes into play. How is that family actually getting the funds? That's where Fund the First steps in. And that's where my detective skills as, a, as uh, an MIP yeah. detective. I was going to ask you, I was going to ask you, has anybody tried to scam you? you? I mean, if, is, is, you, if you know what's surprising? Targeted? We have not had anything. Surprisingly, you know, I was expecting it. Like maybe someone. You're not an easy target. I think it's uh, you know, there's probably, probably some others that are out there that are easier, right? Yeah, yeah. We, you know, I was expecting maybe some of our competitors to maybe do some, some fishing stuff like that, but we haven't had anything. Surprisingly, 
Um, but back to the campaign, with this scenario, we would then verify the next of kin. So we would say, Bob, please provide us with the wife's information. We would contact the wife or the children, contact. We'd ask for birth certificates, uh, proof of marriage, residency, all that kind of stuff. And then that family is the only one that receives the funds. And we have it in a unique way. On these other platforms, it's most of the time they attach their bank account. We don't do that. So when you attach your bank account, what happens is it allows for those scams to actually happen, right? So with this, we send a physical check to the beneficiary of intent. Okay, well, hey, we're talking with uh, Bobby Garland, who's the CEO of Fund the First. We'll be back in a second. Honor, duty, service. At the Veteran Crowd Network, we're focused on our next mission, bringing veterans, veteran-operated businesses, and veteran service organizations together with each other and the resources they need to prosper. That's why we are launching the Veteran Crowd Rewards Program exclusively for our individual and corporate members. Now you can save on travel, restaurants, goods, and services from brands you trust online and at over 900,000 locations nationwide. Find out more today at VeteranCrowdNetwork.com. If you are a veteran, a veteran-operated business, or a VSO, consider the connections, the network, the benefits, the engagement, and success of working with other veterans again. The Veteran Crowd Network, you paid a lot of dues to join this club. Welcome back. My guest is Bobby Garland, uh, CEO of Fund the First. Uh, Bobby, I want to go back and talk about you before you did Fund the First because you had a pretty interesting life uh, <laughs> before all of this. Uh, tell everybody about your your experiences on the beat. Sure. I mean, I had a long career. Uh, let's, let's take that back for a second. Most people will say I have a short career, right? 14 years is not a, not a very long career. However, uh, I did my time in the streets. Um, I did what's called Impact in Manhattan in, in uh, Midtown, where I'm on the streets in uniform for about, about 10 months I was there. Then I transferred to being on patrol. I was in a patrol car for about a year. And then I went to anti-crime. I was in a plainclothes unit addressing the immediate concerns of the precinct that I was in, which where I was was mostly burglaries, robberies, grand larcenies, pickpockets, stuff like that. And then I wanted to excel my career. and basically follow my father's footsteps and I wanted to be a detective and I went into narcotics and you've narcotics seen some was, stuff man I'm you know narcotics was a fun time um, I'll be retiring out of narcotics uh, very soon I'm not going to announce the date yet but it's coming up and um, you know narcotics was a fun time I did wire cases I did search warrants bought drugs you name it I was there and a very very fun time unfortunately I got hurt there uh, and that's why I, my career is ending. But listen, what I learned there in my career as a detective allowed me to transition into um, being a business professional. And what I mean by that is caseload. When you're a detective and you're handling all these different cases and you see on your screen, you know, you, you bought drugs on Monday, you bought drugs Tuesday, you bought drugs Wednesday, and you have all these cases you're investigating, you're running their cell phones, you're running their, their addresses, you're figuring out who, who the supplier is, who this is that. And then all of a sudden your caseload is gigantic. You get a huge caseload and you do a wire and on your wire case, you have, you know, let's say 36 uh, with mine specifically, I had a large one. I had 36 subjects that we took down in one night, but it was a year and a half wire investigation that I was doing. And by doing this and having a case file of 500 specific files that each one had pages upon pages upon pages, it allowed me to understand how the business world worked by that caseload. It really helped me to transition into a business and building a business out. Before I follow that particular thread, mm -hmm. I just got to ask a question. I mean, the fentanyl issues and all that kind of stuff. I mean, and and with the stress of COVID, I mean, are we seeing the narcotics problem just being exacerbated right now? I mean, from my point of view and where I've been, it's been constant. It's been the same. Yeah. So it's really been the same. Um, I've been off the streets now for two years with my injury. So I really, I'm not diving into exactly what's going on in the streets there. I know, uh, I'm sure you see policing in the news and how everything has been taking a step back towards being that 
proactive cop now. You know, there's no longer the proactive cop. You know, now it's the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, the reactive cop, right? There's no more pro proactive, it's reactive. And with that, I mean, listen, more crime is happening. You know, it's unfortunate, more crime is happening. Uh, but the drug scene, it's the same. It's always been there. It's always going to be there. Yeah, I, you know, I, 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 I just think there's a lot of pressure right now. Inflation, you know, there's a lot of talk about an increase in violent crime. Uh, you know, it, it's just t tough duty. I didn't, didn't want to get into a conversation about police work, but I think I think it's all <laughs> relevant. So, so now, you say having been a detective makes you a better business person. Okay, so. Can can you let me drill down on that a little bit because I you know I follow this lead with a lot of military veterans right mm -hmm. and they sit there and say um, uh, you know uh, I got a lot of disciplines in the military that have helped me be a successful business person is that part of it? Absolutely. I mean, structures everything. You know, if you have a good foundation, you're able to excel in that foundation that you have and continue your growth. Now, what I was able to, to see, I always had these ideas throughout my career as a detective, as a police officer, of starting a different business, starting this, starting that. And I never knew like how to really start it. And then when I saw the caseload that I had with with these giant wire cases that I was running, and wow, this one particular wire case was 36, 36 subjects in one night, 22 doors that we hit across four different states. It was insane. I had 500 cops help me out with this case. And when you're the lead investigator on this and you see what you're able to do, why are you going to limit yourself? Why limit yourself? In life? I saw that I could do more. And then this idea of fun the first because of the hardship that I saw one of my closest friends going through was in my head. I said, you know what? If I could do this, this wire case, which is probably the most stressful thing that anybody could ever go through, I could run a successful business. And that's where I really started to research how, where do I start? Right. Did, did, did you have the, let me ask this question. Did you have the passion to be a police officer and a detective that you've got for fun the first? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it was, it, it's, it's, it's the family business, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, so to speak. But, but, you know, I think in order to be good at something, you got to love what you're doing. You do. You do. You have to love what you're doing. And, you know, you see too many people that, that form a company or they're in a career and they don't love it. And they're just doing it for the dollar. I don't chase that at all. I chase it for the passion. I legitimately, I loved being a detective. It was one of the, I heard my father's stories growing up and I said, I want to do that. And I got to do it. You know, it's incredible. I'll be able to pass down those stories to my kids. You know, they're a little too young right now to understand it. And, but the passion, it's so, it's, it's here. It really is here. And the passion with what I did as a detective and now with Fun the First, it will never be successful if I let go of that passion, I just start chasing dollar signs. The passion has to always be there. What's all right? So where are we going with fun? The first, let's you know where you, you've obviously got the stake in the ground. You you know over three hundred successful campaigns, a lot going on. What's the future hold? Where's what's the next couple of years look like now that you got this thing out of the garage and really up and running? Yeah, so um, we're still early stage. I mean, we're only uh, one year and what is it? we're not even two years old yet. You know, not even two years old yet. We're, we're still very early stage. We've been very successful to say we've raised millions of dollars to say we've raised to, that we've had almost 50,000 people donate to campaigns on our platform across the country to say that that we've been featured in Forbes, Entrepreneur, uh, Fox and Friends multiple times. The veteran NBC, crowd spotlight. Everywhere. The veteran crowd spotlight. spotlight multiple times. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to, exactly. To sit, the publicity that we've had for such for a, a startup is incredible. And people kill for publicity like this over a career of 10, 15 years with their company. So we're so blessed to be where we are right now. But the future is, is gigantic. We have we had just recently, because of what we've seen go on in our platform, we eliminated our platform fee. Originally, it was 5% on platform where let's say someone donated $100 to your fundraiser, you'll see 95, mm -hmm. gone. We got rid of that. We wanted to be more transparent to everybody because people always get concerned with hidden fees. You know, so there's all that kind of stuff. Now there's just it's a credit card processing fee, which unfortunately we cannot get rid of. We have to keep that, that's everywhere. 
it's super small it's 2.9 percent. it's nothing um however we we're now allowing for people to maximize on their donations um so with that we're hoping that it increases our campaign 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 flow and we want to be in the households of everybody across the country by year five that's our goal year five is to be a household name and right now we're doing listen we have thousands of people visit our website and we do no marketing everything's word of mouth everything's word of mouth so to have that type of exposure just from word of mouth is huge so we really want to be able to provide everybody with a trusted resource and we're getting there is there, is there a story right now, uh, a campaign maybe that we could highlight and just talk about? Is there one that jumps out to you right now that, that uh, people ought to hear about, just to give an example? People ought to hear about. Um, I mean, we could go back to, unfortunately, our biggest campaigns are line of duty deaths. Right. You know, those are the ones that really raise considerable amount of funds. And I'll use an example of one. Um, last month well now we're in april so two months ago i'm sure you heard about uh detectives Moore and rivera and the nypd they were killed yeah. in line of duty yeah that was, horrible. Uh, horrible almost an execution style kind of a situation yep and it's almost like we hear that all the time it's mm. horrible mm. so that happens what happened someone from their precinct came to fund the first.com and started a fundraiser and we were able to raise i won't say fund the first but they're their network was able to raise five, almost five hundred and fifty thousand dollars. That's insane. Where, insane is that, of where is that money going? What's, so, that, what's it? What's the proceeds going to go toward? Mm -hmm. So the first check I actually gave something like this. Normally we mail out the checks, but if the families request to meet in person, we do do it. Um, two weeks ago, I was able to meet with Mrs. Rivera, and I gave her her first check. So that's her half of the campaign. And then today, I'm actually meeting with the Mora family. I'm going uptown in the, in the city, and I'm meeting with the Mora family to give them their check. Now that campaign will always stay open. It will always, you know, continue to grow, and we'll always, you know, divvy out those funds to those families. But to see a campaign like that come together and come full circle and really support those families that are in need during such a troubling time is gigantic. I mean, we is, have has Fund the First got a national footprint yet? Have you uh, got concentrations in the Northeast or? What's what's the what's the footprint looking like? We really have fundraisers all over the country. And you know what? Can I share my screen? I want to show you something cool. Let's I, see. I, oh, I, I got to do the advanced sharing options on the fly here, but go for it. All right. So here we go. I'm going to show you something really cool. Okay. Can you see my screen? It's coming up now. Excellent. All right. So this is our website, like, like we've spoken about. But I want to go to... While, while you're page. talking, it's fundthefirst.com, fundthefirst.com, and we'll put links to this for those of you that are listening uh, on uh, on the show notes here. So right here, I'm on our stats page, and this is public to anybody because we want to be transparent. Transparency is everything. Now, you'll see we've raised, not we, but the fundraisers on our platform have raised $3.8 million, 32,000 unique donors. What that means is those donors could have donated more than one time. And we do, we have recurring donors, which is huge. Registered users, 6,000. We don't require users to register on our platform. Uh, originally, when we started, we were requiring people to register in order to donate to a fundraiser. But we noticed that the, the, um, the donations were not increasing. They were actually decreasing that way. So we took that away. So people, if people register, if they just want to be part of the, the platform, that's fine. And 346 fundraisers launched. We have this really cool map. When someone does register on the platform, it shows where they're from. So we're concentrated basically all over the place. And you can see we have a heavy concentration in Florida. Um, we have a heavy concentration in New York. Um, and then California, we have a heavy concentration. But we have people, users from all over the country. And I think there's one state still, Nebraska, that we do not have a user from. Uh, but other than that, we're all over the country. Come on, Nebraska. You guys, <laughs> yeah. corn huskers, need to get off the couch and get to work. <laughs> but these are, again, these are only registered users. We don't we don't have that information. I mean, obviously, we can analyze everything that's based on IP addresses to figure out where the donors are from. But user stats by group, this is just of registered users on the platform. And then user stats by badge. This is something pretty cool and unique that we have. 
if you're a registered user on the platform and you donated a hundred dollars, you get this cool little badge, this brown bronze badge. Got, got some platinum and diamond, man. What yep. So, those? so a uh, thousand dollars to hit yep. diamond. Wow. So diamond, we've had, we've had now, but those are just registered users. We've had unregistered users donate ten thousand dollars to it. It's there. Corporate corporate donors as well. We've had a few, uh, not many. They're mostly from the individual. Um, you know, uh, let me bring up that that fundraiser that I was just talking about uh, with Moore and Rivera. Our homepage will always show our top fundraisers. So these four fundraisers, this one raised 521,000, 230,000, 204,000, 166,000. But if you look at one of our fundraisers, super simple and super transparent the way it's set up. You know, you see exactly what it's for, who it's for, who organized it, who the beneficiary is. We have some updated uh, cosmetics coming to the platform. They're gonna be launching on Monday or Tuesday. I wish I was showing them to you right now because they're incredible. We have some really nice cosmetic things coming out. The platform looks great. You know, it has a story here. It will show every single update if they've ever made an update to the platform, uh, to their campaign, uh, donations that have come in, stuff like that. You click donate, again, super simple. The form pops up. Something unique that we put here, we put the average donation on our platform. So average donation across the entire platform was $81. And then the highest donation to this particular fundraiser was 10,000. Play a little psychologic, psychologics on the uh, on the donor, right? So they could see that and say, oh, I don't wanna donate less than $81 because that's the platform, you know, platform average. And then they say, well, I can't donate 10,000 because that's a lot. But most of the time, you know, donors will stay in that $100 range. And then you just put in your information here. Um, now, but What's every unique? look, every donation helps, uh, no matter how large or how small. Hey, Bobby, we we we're out of time. I want to I want to. Yeah. Uh, uh, how do people get in touch with you? Uh, what's the best way to reach Bobby Garland? And then, of course, we're going to put links to fund the first on the show notes. Sure, you guys listen. I allow everyone. My phone number is always open. Email is always open. We'll I like put it to be on there. the show notes, so you have to go put to the it, show notes to get it. And, it uh, and 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 uh, we'll do that. Mommy Garland, uh, you know, I I am amazed at what you're doing, how much you guys have accomplished. Uh, great work. Uh, I'm just, you know, really pleased. Thanks again for revisiting the spotlight and giving us the update. It's a great update, a great story. Thanks, Bob. I, I really appreciate being here. Thank you. Hey, you've been listening to the Spotlight on the Veteran Crowd Network. Our guest today, again, has been Bobby Garland, CEO of Fund the First. Uh, thank you so much for stepping into the program. I'm going to give the Army bravo Zulu for that performance, folks, and that's a wrap. Thank you for listening to Spotlight by Veteran Crowd. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. For more information and uploads, please visit our website at VeteranCrowdNetwork.com. We'll see you next time.